thing about that is that, uh, I, you know, I come from a show business background. My dad, Robert Winkler, Robert Bobby Winkler, was a well-known child actor, teenage actor, kid star in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, my dad worked in over 80 movies and over 200 radio shows with almost all the stars of the golden age of Hollywood. It was His career was remarkable. Um, he was born in Chicago, and his uh, grandmother got him into, or his aunt got him into uh, doing amateur contests and teaching him how to sing, and he wound up performing in all the vaudeville clubs and all the dance-a-thons and walk-a-thons and all the things, and he won a lot of prizes uh, for doing it. And he uh, got into show business in Chicago, and he did all the radio shows, playing kid parts and everything, and then sang at the Democratic Convention for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He sang the national anthem, and Charlie Chaplin's wife, Mildred Harris Chaplin, saw my dad and thought he was a very talented kid, and wrote a letter of introduction to Hal Roach Studios in Hollywood. And my dad and his mother and father said, we'll go to Hollywood and Bobby will have a big career. And so it happened. Uh, he went to Hal Roach Studios. He worked in the R Gang comedies with Spanky and Alfalfa and Buckwheat. And you can look up the titles. He like Pigskin, Palooka, General Spanky, Football Romeo, Pays You Exit, Hearts or Thumps, all R Gang Follies. Uh, he did a ton of that stuff. He did a lot of work with Patsy Kelly and other stars at Roach and uh, Eddie Cantor and whatnot, and uh, went to the Hollywood Professional School. And there were tons of celebrity friends of his there that he worked with, and Donald O'Connor and whatnot. But uh, Dad did, a, did so much work with almost all the stars at that time and worked in Sullivan's Travels, with Joel McRae, that was a Preston Sturgis movie, considered one of the top 100 movies of all time. He worked, uh, he played Pat O'Brien as a boy in The Iron Major, which is a big film. Uh, it was funny, my dad was also in, he did so much radio. He was a regular, he played the newsboy on Big Town with Edward G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson was a big, famous uh, gangster movie actor and such. Uh, and they'd have two shows, one for the East Coast and one for the West Coast. And during lunch, Mr. Robinson would have dinner or with my father and my grandfather. And my dad was going to audition to play Pat O'Brien as a boy, and he had the script with him. And Edward G. Robinson said, what do you got, what do you got there, Bobby? You know, and he says, oh, I'm, I'm auditioning to play Pat O'Brien as a boy. And he said, let me see those sides. Let me see the script. He said, okay, Bobby, this is what you're going to do, see? This is how you're going to play the part, see? And he goes through the whole thing. And so anyway, Dad did what Edward G. Robinson told him to do, and he booked the part, and he got the role playing Pat O'Brien as a boy in The Iron Major. So when you see that movie, it's actually Bobby Winkler playing Edward G. Robinson doing Pat O'Brien as a boy. <laughs> anyway, Dad also did a ton of westerns, and he loved working at Iverson's Ranch and doing all... He worked with all the major cowboy stars. It was amazing. Almost every major cowboy movie star at that time, Dad worked in, or worked with them in their films. Uh, Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, Wild Bill Elliott, Bob Steele, Johnny Mac Brown, Tim McCoy, Bob Baker... Uh, Bob Livingston, George Houston, George Montgomery, all the stars, and, and the comedic uh, sidekicks, Smiley Burnett and Ruth Davis, and I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. Dad loved working on westerns. I remember him telling me in one of his westerns, uh, Bad Men of Missouri, which was in at Universal, they had a, it was about the uh, Dalton brothers, or Younger Brothers, I think, the famous gang, and they had a Dalton gang member who was a senior citizen who'd been let out of jail after his crimes, and he was a, he was actually a, uh, a supervisor or a technical consultant for this movie. My dad was like, "Wow, there's this real gangster from the not gangster outlaw cowboy outlaw from that era." You have to remember in the '30s and '40s, people who'd lived in the real West. Some of them were senior citizens at the time that all those cowboy movies were being made. So 
dad uh, dad had a fantastic career, and um, you know he he did cartoon voices for Walt Disney and Bambi, and uh, you know Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies. There was a time in the '30s and '40s where you could go to a movie house, and Bobby Winkler was uh, the voice in the cartoon in the Looney Tune cartoon, and then you'd see a, a specialty like Pete Smith's specialty or some little newsreel or whatever. And Dad would be in the Pete Smith, Smith specialty. And then you'd have a serial. Dad was in one of the most famous serials of all time, considered the one of the best, a top two or three, Daredevils of the Red Circle. And he was the star, the child star of it, and the catalyst of the whole story. William Whitney directed it. So you'd see Dad in the serial, and then you'd see him in the Western, you know, if it was an Autry movie or Wild Bill Elliott or... Johnny Mac Brown or whatever, and then he'd be in the A picture, like, you know, Waterloo Bridge or one of these other A movies, and then when you got home, you turn on the radio, there he was on radio, on Lux Radio Theater with Cecil B. DeMille or, you know, uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson's A Big Town or whatever, or Bob Hope or Jack Benny or, uh, you know, he, he played W.C. Field's son on radio, uh, you know, I, I could go on and on and on. Well, what happened was he, he had this fantastic career, and he caught the tail end of World War II, and he volunteered to go into the Army Air Corps. And he had action in the Philippines, and they machine-gunned at him, and the jeep overturned on I mean, there's a whole story there. And, um, and then when he came back, the business was kind of in a mess because the government said that the movie studios could no longer own the movie theaters. That the, the studios had owned the theaters and it was kind of a violation of state and federal antitrust laws and so they had this law that said you had to break up. You either had to be a producer of films or you had to be an exhibitor. And so there were all these things. His lifetime agent had retired, Marty Sperber, and his parents said, you have to go to college. And so dad went to college, he became interested in law. I will say this, Dad worked as an adult in crisscross with Burt Lancaster and uh, Yvonne DiCarlo while he was going to law school. He became interested in law. And also he did a film with Johnny Mac Brown playing the younger leading man. Dad was supposed to do another 12 pictures with Johnny Mac Brown. The formula was gonna be Johnny Mac Brown as the older, kind of Hopalong Cassidy cowboy lead father figure and Ray Hatton was going to be the comedy relief and then my dad Bob Winkler was going to be Robert Winkler was going to be the young leading man who'd have the romances with the leading ladies dad did the first picture but he did not do the other 11 films so uh, he became interested in law had had a very successful entertainment attorney, uh, entertainment law firm, representing uh, writers, producers, directors, actors that he'd worked with as a kid. So it was the most amazing thing, uh, you know, that, for example, George Montgomery, he was in a movie called Last of the Duanes, and then later in life he represented George Montgomery as a client. George was a very nice man, wonderful guy. And after Dad uh, became an attorney, a dad had an uh, incredibly successful law firm, and he represented writers, producers, directors, people he worked with, actors he worked with. He had like three law offices. He had like tons of armies of secretaries, busy, 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 incredibly, incredibly successful. But he had, you know, all these clients, like I said, George Montgomery and Al Molinero, and, and he did work for Adam West and lots of other people and writers and Earl Felton, who wrote the screenplay for 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for Walt Disney. And uh, he would still have fans come into his law offices for autographs and stuff. They'd track him down, Western movie fans, and come out. I remember Dad represented an Indian tribe, and there was an Indian chief who would come in to see him, and in full headdress and Indian outfit. I mean, it was like something, like he walked off of a movie set. It was amazing. And uh, I remember a funny thing about Al Molinero, who had been on Happy Days, because it was before he had Happy Days, or he was an actor. He says, he said to Dad, Bob, I'm going to be a model. <laughs> and Dad said, Al, 
<laughs> Have you looked in the mirror? I mean, you're a character actor. You're a model? A male model? And sure enough, Al became a model. He was on all these billboards called Kiss... It was like Kiss the Cook or whatever. And I think Happy Days came out of that ad. Dad won a lot. I mean, most of his cases, he would always win the cases. And Melvin Belli and F. Lee Bailey hated my dad. <laughs> they were of that whole era because my dad would always win the cases. You know, funny thing, dad handled a little bit of uh, criminal law as well, but he, he had to give it up. He couldn't take it. One time he got this guy, he was a compulsive purse thief. This man would steal women's purses all the time, and Dad was, I don't know, the evidence was kind of funny, and Dad wound up getting him off, but he was going to go to jail for many years for stealing women's purses. So he's in my dad's office. He says, Bob, thank you so much for helping me, and blah, 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 and everything else. Thank you very much. And he, as he, he left the office, about two minutes later, the secretary came and said, Bob, what, what's the matter? That guy just stole my purse. He represented custom car builder George Barris, who built the Batmobile and the Munsters coach and the Dragula and the Monkey Mobile and all those famous custom cars and hot rods of the 50s and 60s for the celebrities and everything. So Dad represented was good friends with George. And even back in the 50s, they'd be playing cards when Dad was single and they'd chase girls on the beach and they'd play cards with Keenan Wynn and all these other celebrity uh, people. Um, you know, the other thing, too, was that dad's dad had sensational cases, uh, criminal cases and other cases that were always in the newspapers of the L.A. Times, and Daily News and all that here. And uh, some of his cases established laws in California uh, at the time. Um, there was uh, one woman who there was one famous murder case where. The woman, uh, the husband murdered the wife, and she was a communist, and she was doing all these radical things and, you know, committing crimes, and the husband in some crime killed her. Dad won the case, and the guy got off, and the lawyer who was representing the woman who was accused of being a communist radical whatever, um, Dad pulled a very famous, uh, it was in the LA Times, a very unusual stunt. He called the attorney to the stand and went for the, for the communist lady and said, are you now an, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? <laughs> and he took the fifth and that was the end of the case. That's how <laughs> and in the 1950s, Dad also wrote a law book for kids called Laws for Youth. And it was sort of like a guide for parents and kids about the laws of California and how you're supposed to, you know, not get into trouble if you do these things and blah, blah, blah. And it's so funny to read it today, you know, because I think we need that book again today. <laughs> Dad had a successful acting career, and then he had a successful military career, then he had a successful law career. It's an amazing thing. And later in life, he was a member of the Republican Party, and... Believe it or not, the Republican Party had asked him in 1980 to run for Congress because they needed somebody to be a congressman in this district. Um, and there'd been a man named Anthony Bielinson who had been the district uh, congressman. He was the Democrat, and he was always, you know, he was always winning, and they needed to have somebody to try to run against him. So Dad really didn't want to be a politician. He said, oh, boy. But they twisted his arm, and he said, okay, I agree, I'll do it. So he ran for Congress, and it just so happened in 1980 that Ronald Reagan lived in the district that my dad was running for Congress. And now dad had worked with Ronald Reagan in the life of Newt Rockne, All-American. He had been in that movie as a kid actor. So anyway, when they went back to Washington, D.C., dad met with Reagan, and dad knew Reagan from parties that would happen in Bel Air, and my parents would go to the parties that Reagan would have, and whatnot. But anyway, so he went back to Washington, D.C., and Ronald Reagan was there and uh, was very enjoying talking to my father. And he said, you know, Bob, I voted for you. <laughs> and my dad said, well, I voted for you too, Dutch, you know. And they, that was his name, Dutch Reagan. And, those. and uh, 
then he was saying, well, Bobby worked in Lute Rockney, whatever, you know, and George Bush, oh, is that right? Is that right? You know, it's very funny. Um, I remember meeting Reagan when I was a little boy and uh, shaking his hand and everything else. And Well, sadly, sadly, he came danger. He won the primary and he came very dangerously close to winning. And... Uh, he thought, oh, God, am I going to have to really do this, you know? And it was like uh, he came very close. And he didn't spend any money or anything. I mean, he wasn't going to, I mean, he did it just to kind of put a name on a ballot. It, he didn't want to, you know. But uh, sadly, he, he did, he got stomach cancer in 1989, and he passed away very quickly, and it was it was awful. But because um, he could have, I mean, his mother lived into her 80s. There's no reason why he couldn't have continued you know, another 20, 30 years. But, um, you know, so I'm glad he didn't win because he spent the time with us, you know, my, my sister and I and my mother. Besides my dad, my mom, Betty Winkler, whose maiden name was Betty Sturm, she was also in the business shortly, I mean, for a short period of time. Uh, she's German. She came from Germany and she moved into the Hollywood Studio Club, which was the place that all the good girl actresses in Hollywood at the time went to. They were chaperoned, and it was a secure building, and, you know, the ladies who ran it. Mary Pickford ran, uh, started the Hollywood Studio Club. And my mom was there, and she did some acting. Her her roommates uh, at the same place were like Joanne Worley from Laugh-In and Pat Priest from The Munsters. And uh, Mom did a couple of movies. She did a sort of a uh, an Arabian Nights film where she played a harem girl. And then she, Mom, appeared in this very, very famous cult movie that Timothy Carey made called The World's Greatest Sinner. The World's Greatest Sinner was about this guy who became a superstar like an Elvis Presley type guy. And it went to his head and he thought he was God and he became kind of a Hitler type of character. And he had followers, and my mother was one of the followers, and she was kind of like the Ava Brown to Adolf Hitler, you know? Crazy. And uh, guys like Quentin Tarantino and all of them, they know the world's greatest sinner. This movie plays and plays, and it's like an underground cult movie, famous film. And uh, Martin Scorsese knows it. And so, anyway, Mom played this part, but Timothy Carey took about a year to make this movie, and... About six months into it, my mom said, enough already, uh, and she met my father, and they were going to get married. And so mom uh, didn't finish the picture. And later, Timothy Carey wrote a letter to her, and my dad got it, and he said, Betty, do you want to, Timothy Carey wants you to come back and do that movie. Do you want to? She says, no, I'm married. I'm going to have children. I have a family. I'm a, I don't want to be part of it anymore. So Timothy Carey wound up, because my dad would have been cool with it, and so my so Timothy Carey hired a woman to do little saxophone playing or whatever that looked kind of like my mom, but it wasn't her. That My mom's part was much, much bigger in the final cut. But anyway, mom's in it, and it's a crazy movie. But prior to meeting my dad and prior to The World's Greatest Sinner, one funny quick story, uh, mom went on a double date with Elvis Presley, and they went to go see Psycho at a movie, uh, a drive-in movie theater. And it was so funny because as soon as the famous shower scene started where the killer went in and he got the ee, 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 Elvis couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand the sight of the blood and he left the drive-in theater and took everybody with him because he couldn't stand that. So that was pretty funny. My, uh, my mother really didn't want to pursue acting other than those two pictures that she did. And uh, Timothy Carey's son later called her and said, will you be part of this documentary? And I think I think maybe Tarantino was part of the documentary or Martin Scorsese or Jack Nicholson might have been part of it. I don't know. I, a lot of people were part of it. They wanted her to be part of it. And she did. She participated in it. She liked Timothy Carey. She liked... Timothy Carey was married to a German lady. So they got along on the set and they were out in Pasadena or something. And uh, the son, Romeo Carey, was very nice. But uh, anyway, uh, so mom's part of this picture. When I show it to her, she gets very embarrassed. In the 1960s and early to mid-70s, my mother was in the wig business. 
and she used to sell wigs to Disneyland. Uh, the girls who were Snow White and Cinderella and, and, and Alice in Wonderland would wear my mother's hair pieces. And sometimes the Pirates of the Caribbean pirates, too, would wear her hair pieces. So when we were little kids, my mother would say, come on, kids, I got to go to Disneyland. We, I have wigs I have to deliver. And so my sister Patricia and I, we'd be like six and five and six or six and seven, whatever, we would uh, go to Disneyland. And after my mother would do her big business backstage, we would be given free tickets to go into the park and we'd go around to, you know, fantasy land or whatever. And we'd spend maybe a few hours and we'd leave. Well, this happened over and over and over and over again to the point where we didn't want to go to Disneyland anymore. We were probably the only two children in the entire world that when my mom said, when, when the parents says, hey, kids, come on, we got to go to Disneyland, we cried, no, we don't want to go to Disneyland.